Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos in our Platonic Dialogues group reading challenge in which we, the members of the School of Forbidden Texts, cover every one of the Platonic Dialogues, ideally at a rate of once per week, although I do apologize that there's been a bit of a delay recently, but uh, we're back on track now, moving on to Plato's Symposium. This is the ninth um, out of the first ten dialogues which we agreed on all the way back in May, and we are arriving now at um, really one of Plato's most famous dialogues. This is one of his most widely and read and most widely discussed texts because the Symposium is Plato's famous dialogue on the topic of love, although I have to caution you from the start that um, by love, Plato might not have meant what you think he meant by that term. Yes, there's a certain ambiguity with regard to different kinds of love, which um, it's a little hard to distinguish um, unless you do so very explicitly within English, because in English, once again, we just have one word, love. Well, in Greek, that's kind of resolved by um, having four different words for um, showing explicitly the, the difference between um, the, the kind of love that you feel romantically versus the kind of love which is more like a friendship versus the kind of love which God had for the human race. Christian pastors typically mention for example, that um, the word used for the kind of love which Jesus is described as having had for the human race in the New Testament, um, well, that's described with the word agape, which is a word which actually occurs fairly rarely in um, non-biblical Greek texts. You can do a numerical comparison between the number of times the word agape is used um, in, say, Homer versus how often it's used in the Gospels, as uh, Fulton Sheen did on his uh, 1950s show, Life is Worth Living. He was a Catholic priest who noted, I think Homer used agape only a few times within the Iliad, but it occurs uh, many, many, many times within the Gospels, okay? And you can look that up yourself, but you can see that um, the kind of love which um, Jesus is described as having had for the human race is definitely not the kind of love which the symposium about, yeah, symposium is about, because um, the symposium is not about the kind of selfless love in which the only thing one desires is whatever is best for the one who is loved. No, the symposium is about a different kind of love than that, one arguably on the surface is much more vulgar, but it's also not about the kind of brotherly love um, after which the American city Philadelphia, um, the murder capital of the USA, by the way, uh, was ironically named, or one might even say it's a misnomer to call that extremely violent place Philadelphia, or the city of brotherly love. Well, at any rate, um, the uh, symposium is not about that kind of love either, which is really kind of more like friendship. Rather, symposium is um, about the the uh, erotic love which you have in the literal sense of talking about the god Eros himself. But in order to not misunderstand this in line with the kind of modern prejudices we have, we must bear in mind that for the ancient Greeks, the relation between a god or goddess and the thing which they were associated with was much more direct and much less symbolic than we typically imagine today. For example, um, Zeus was not thought to be a god who had a merely symbolic relation to thunder and lightning. No, for the ancient Greeks, Zeus himself simply is thunder and lightning, so whenever these meteorological forces are unleashed in your presence, you can directly experience Zeus, um, though hopefully not too directly or you might be electrocuted. Um, you can only wonder what happened the times that he descended to the earth to impregnate various women that he mortal women, I should add, that he found attractive, and that's how we got demigods like Hercules. Well, hopefully the experience of uh, being struck by lightning um, for them was not uh, too traumatic, but uh, we'll just leave that to the imagination. But at any rate, um, when the Greeks are talking about erotic love, they're really, as ancient Greek pagans, talking about the god Eros, who is, once again, not just symbolically associated with that phenomenon, rather Eros himself is the force which you directly feel stirring up within you at those most intense moments of sexual desire. So to put it very bluntly, as my ancient philosophy professor did, um, Eros is really just horniness. So the symposium is a dialogue about horniness, plain and simple. Now, before we get into the text itself, we also have to note that um, on a stylistic level, the symposium also differs from Plato's other works in that um, rather than have the usual um, constant back and forth between Socrates and one of his Socratized victims, the symposium instead consists of a set of very long but um, very good speeches 
which are given by other characters who are present at a banquet which is being given at somebody's house. And uh, the interesting thing is that even when Socrates does get his turn to speak, he largely just shares the wisdom which a certain mysterious older woman had imparted to him when she had um, educated him on the subject of Eros many years earlier. It bears mentioning that um, whereas Socrates usually famously admits that the only thing he does know about the thing being discussed um, is that he doesn't know anything about it, um, this time we have an exception to that general rule. Um, in the symposium, when the subject is Eros, he kind of jumps at the opportunity to say, um, with regard to this one thing, hey, this is a topic he actually does know quite a lot about. So we can only guess how good the education he received from this lady was. And so as we get into the text itself, uh, we find uh, many years after this event had happened that uh, one day Apollodorus is asked by somebody um, if he remembers the famous speeches um, given in praise of love, or rather of eros and horniness, um, which had been uh, delivered that day by uh, people like Socrates, Alcibiades, um, etc. Various people gathered at the house of Agathon, um, which is an interesting name for the guy hosting this party because he is himself called the good. Well, we find uh, years ago that Agathon had held a banquet, um, which uh, Socrates and others had attended, but this party was a little bit different. It had some interesting rules, to say the least. One of these rules was that um, the guests were actually asked to serve the host rather than the other way around. Another rule was that everybody agreed in advance that they would not drink to excess. This was both for fear of hangover, um, something done in accord with the professional advice of a physician who was present among the guests that day, but um, this was also for the higher purpose of having their entertainment be a little bit different from usual. At the beginning of the party, um, they tell the flute girl that she's dismissed. She can go off and play some music for herself because um, today the guests uh, were going to entertain themselves rather than just outsource that job to her. The way that they would entertain themselves was with discussion, and of course with the most pleasant kind of discussion, which is a philosophical discussion. Now, the philosophical topic of the day was really more like a challenge for somebody to provide an answer um, to the riddle why exactly it was that among the gods of ancient Greece, um, the only one who seems to not have many great hymns and poems written in his honor is the god of love. Now, this is strange because he would seem to be very important, but um, even... Uh, mere mortals, like human heroes, have various songs written in their honor, and um, at one point in this dialogue it's mentioned that uh, they'd found a philosophical work which had been written for the purpose of praising the benefits of salt. So even salt has um, a text written in, in its honor praising it, but um, Eros, which is once again very important in human life, um, has been snubbed in this regard. So the challenge really is to try to understand why that's the case. Well, one thing is for sure, um, if nothing else, this uh, lack of attention, this neglect, will end tonight because each man present at this party, one by one, will be tasked with giving some great speech in honor of Eros precisely in order to make up for this lack which had prevailed up to this point. Well, it's interesting that Phaedrus would be um, the first one to open our discussions of love on a philosophical level now, but he actually takes us in a rather different direction than had been the case in that dialogue named after him. For now he notes that uh, the way to really understand love is not just to consider his effects as we directly experience them within the present uh, moment, but rather to try to think about love on a historical level. Um, we have have evidence from people like, say, Hesiod, that love is actually the oldest of all the gods. And we know that he's the oldest one because um, on a genealogical level, we don't actually know who his parents were. This is a really big deal in the ancient world, by the way. If you look at all the pages within the Bible that are devoted to genealogy, it seems strange to a modern reader, but once again, it was a really big deal within the ancient world. So if we don't even know who uh, Love's parents were, that's actually, in a strange sense, a good thing because this means um, that uh, to find the origins of Love, you have to go all the way back to the origins of the universe. Hesiod's account of the um, history of the whole cosmos was that chaos was the first thing which existed, but after chaos, immediately you have Earth and Love following 
as the next oldest things that ever have existed. So the implication here is that when chaos was transformed into order, keep in mind that when the Greeks talk about a cosmos, they're basically talking about something like something that has been transformed into a proper order, um, rather than just appealing to, you know, a universe in the sense of the, the largest thing in which everything else is contained. No, really for the Greeks, if you're talking about cosmos, you're already talking about something like organization and order. Well, um, which discovered here that you only have that order to the cosmos because you have love. Now, that will sound very strange to a modern reader. Uh, why exactly is it that we should have love in addition to Earth? Isn't it enough just to have Earth? to have something like cosmos by the ancient Greek understanding of that term. Well, the reason you have to include love as equally important is that love here is thought of as a force of attraction. It's something which brings together the elements that should be together, and if that happens, that will result in the kind of order which you take for granted. Without love, in other words, um, none of the other gods, none of the things, none of the people could exist because each one of those are really composite wholes which are made up of certain smaller parts which require love or eros to bring them together and to keep them in that unified state. Likewise, it really does make sense that the oldest god in terms of time would also be the most beneficial god, although Phaedrus is careful to clarify this is not just in terms of the obvious pleasure one gets from Eros in the here and now. Um, there's also a certain kind of benefit which is transitively passed on from Eros to all of the other virtues, and therefore Eros provides something like the transcendental conditions which makes virtue itself possible. That will sound bizarre to a modern reader influenced by, say, the Christian tradition, but um, he actually had pretty good reasons for making that argument. He noted, for example, that one is motivated to act honorably rather than dishonorably only because of love. We know this because getting caught acting dishonorably is bad no matter who you do it in front of, uh, but it's uh, much worse if you get caught acting that way in the presence of your lover. So too, um, if your lover is watching you, you'll be more motivated to do heroic acts, especially in the context of battle. Keep in mind that, quite frankly, here he's talking about men loving men. So he noted that you have a, if you had a whole army of men who loved each other in this way, well, that army could hypothetically conquer the whole world because of the transitively passed on benefit where more love equals more courage. It is supremely ironic, then, that the kind of ethics which is inspired by Eros or Hornius um, is a kind of ethics which um, is strictly non-pathological in uh, something like the Kantian sense of that term. We know that this kind of ethics is non-pathological because one will act most heroically precisely when there's no hope of gaining any material benefits for oneself as a result of doing so. We find this in the most extreme, extreme case of being inspired to die for the sake of one's beloved, such as sacrificing one's life on the battlefield to save them. Achilles is praised here as the highest example of this because um, he actually died for somebody who was already himself dead, his friend and lover, Patroclus. So Achilles' ethical commitment really was non-pathological because uh, neither one of them could hope to receive any earthly benefit from his act of accepting death on the battlefield much later during the Trojan War um, because any earthly life left over to receive it was already liquidated for both of them. Phaedrus concludes that insofar as virtue is proven to exist, this is only possible because love or eros or horniness was presupposed as a much more fundamental element within that formula. The next speech is given by someone named Pausanias, who warns that a certain equivocation might be at work here, despite the fact that, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, uh, the Greeks had four different terms to refer to what in modern English is just called the one word love. Well, even if you do correctly choose just the one Greek term, eros, you might actually be referring to uh, one of two things here, and uh, only one of those is really worthy of praise. He clarifies that the love which is merely of the body and not of the soul is the kind of love which is vulgar in the sense that this is the common love that anybody could feel. Uh, he proves that anybody could feel it by knowing that even the immature youth and um, even more so, um, even women 
can feel it, as offensive as that might be today. And we might note in our own terms that uh, this is a kind of desire which is vulgar or universal in the sense that even dogs and lower animals can feel this sort of desire, and uh, more importantly, they can act on it. And we know that this love is not worthy of our philosophical praise because um, the object of this sort of lust is usually base or vulgar itself. And even more so, we know it's not worthy of our praise because the path to obtaining that object is technological in the sense that one will employ whatever means are necessary to achieve the goal without any regard for the good. So this is a strictly amoral technological pursuit using anything available as a means to an end for something which is itself actually uh, base, vulgar, and not worthy of our attention or praise anyway. For just this reason, Pausanias uh, proposes that the love of young boys should be made formally illegal, as it should. And he notes that this is because um, when you're dealing with young ones like this, uh, their future is still uncertain. Um, they are vulgar or base objects of desire because um, they still have time to turn out to be either good or bad. So the pursuit of them when they're still in that transitory stage is inherently out of accord with the philosophical ideal of the good because the good is its something that uh, implies a type of stability which ultimately goes back to the world of ideas or the world of forms. On the other hand, the higher love is one which is good in the precise sense that it will lead you to do acts which are so good that um, even these same acts which would look bad in any other context are praised by others when they're done for the sake of love. To use his own examples, for the sake of love, one might be willing to do things which even one's slaves refuse to do, or one might lie sleeping all night at the doorstep of the beloved. Both of these would seem outright pitiful in any other context, but um, they're worthy of our highest praise when we know that they are done for the sake of love. Likewise, we can now see that the evil one is just the vulgar lover who loves the body but does not love the soul. That kind of love cannot be stable because the thing which it's in love with is itself inherently unstable, and we know that it's unstable because once the youth fades away from that beloved, the lover disappears just as quickly despite all of his promises to the contrary earlier on. But the noble love endures because what it loves is inherently everlasting, which is the immortal soul and, as we shall see, the platonic ideal of the good. The next speech is given by Eryxamachus, who is the physician mentioned very early on within the uh, dialogue, who uh, gives them the advice not to get too drunk. Well, even that advice is really advice about love in disguise. And he notes that um, this is the case because um, whenever you're talking about the health of the human body, you're really talking about the best ways to satisfy the desires in a way that is healthy for the whole person. So the physician actually is an expert on love in the industry direct sense that um, the art of medicine is really about finding ways to resolve conflicts between uh, mutually opposing elements within the body, such as uh, the elements of hot and cold, and uh, to bring those into harmony for the sake of restoring the whole body to a state of better health. So the harmony which you get if you succeed in overcoming those conflicts of opposing elements for the sake of health, well that harmony is itself really a form of love in disguise. Because we can define love that generally, the doctor notes that music also is really about love. Because if you really think about it, a music theory is also just the art of knowing how to create harmony from tones which were originally in opposition to one another. You take one note which is intrinsically high and another note which, a note which is intrinsically low. Well, music theory can tell you how some sort of harmony might be achieved between them despite that fact. So too, astronomy is really about a certain music theory of finding resolution between meteorological forces or uh, heavenly bodies or um, seasons which uh, seem to be opposite, but uh, the idea here is to uh, have a harmony within the heavens. Well, so too, that is really um, an art that has to do with love, and this could be extended even to uh, the science of divination, or as we might say, soothsaying. Um, this is also about love, because here we're trying to find a harmony between the will of the gods on one hand, and human understanding of that will on the other.
Somebody named Aristophanes begins his speech next, uh, noting that love is misunderstood by man, evidenced by the sheer lack of temples which have been built in the honor of the uh, god Eros. But we can only really understand this misunderstanding in its proper context, which is human nature. Human nature is to blame for this neglect of Eros on a religious level, but this is something which has to be understood in its historical context, in the sense that when we talk about human nature today, um, we're actually talking about something a little bit different from what human nature was in the vastly distant past. This is because originally, according to this guy, there were not just two, but there were in fact three different genders. There were males, females, of course, but also the androgynous. Whereas androgyny had become a mere insult word in Plato's time, talking about with that which is both masculine and feminine at the same time, according to this guy, back in the olden days, it actually did refer to a real type of entity. There really was a gender called the androgynous, and this was something which was possible back then because um, in those days, all humans were originally round, and they had four feet and four arms each. Likewise, they moved by turning cartwheels across the floor, to quote the 1960s song, A Whiter Shade of Pale by Procol Harm. Well, for some people, half the body was male and the other half was female, and these were the androgynous. This was possible because the two heads were on opposite sides of the body and did not actually face each other. Now, at this point, Plato sounds a little bit like Julius Evola when he notes that um, in this context, man was symbolic of the sun, woman was symbolic of the earth, but the androgynous was symbolic of the moon. This is because the moon is solar and earthly at the same time. It's both masculine and feminine in the sense that the moon is like a mini earth, but it also shines like the sun does, except that it does so at night. Now, because these four-legged and four-armed beings were too powerful for their own good, which you could expect because they were twice the size of any one of us, um, they were eventually driven to make the grave mistake of attacking the gods themselves. In response to this, the gods contemplated simply annihilating all humans once and for all, but they decided against doing so, if only for the self-interested reason that they realized that if humans went extinct, there would be nobody left to give the gods the worship which they desired, there'd be nobody left to sing hymns, perform rituals, or construct temples for them, in other words. So instead of this, it was decided that the gods would break the humans down into their current much smaller form, with the additional threat that if they they screwed up again, they'd be shrunk down even further to the point of walking on only one leg. Apparently that never happened, so the gods uh, kept good on their word, just as humans apparently did not make the same mistake ever again. As a result, the androgynous beings were split up into sides that were on one hand male and on the other side female, and these separated parts have been seeking each other ever since because they realize that they're just smaller parts of this broader androgynous whole. However, it's apparently only the ones who were separated from the androgynous composite symbolized by the moon that actually do seek out the opposite sex, for as you might recall, there were some who were originally just male, even though they had four arms and four legs, and now the uh, uh, halves of them that were split up only seek males, just as the ones who came from beings that were originally just female, well, today they're called lesbians, as used in the translation of the text itself, um, because they seek out only females, and now we know, uh, apparently, the reason why. Well, the funny thing about the kind of love which one half has for the other is that it cannot be explained away even by the very vulgar fact of sexual intercourse or any other thing for that matter. One desires the other and one knows it, but one can't actually articulate the reasons why one desires them. It really is something of a mystery that defies rational comprehension, precisely for those who experience this Eros the most directly. This is because what one really desires here is simply to restore the unity of that whole that was separated by the gods so long ago. So now we know that the unnameable object of erotic desire is human nature itself. The human nature which was once whole but was then separated, although that fact has come to be forgotten by just about everybody. We now also see that love is properly defined as the desire to make human nature whole once again. This is transitively the secret to human happiness, for if this human nature were restored to its whole state, everybody would find the happiness that they have been seeking. 
Agathon provides the last speech before Socrates' turn by objecting. No, actually, love is the youngest god, not the oldest, as had been said earlier. And it's precisely because he's the youngest god that we know that he's the fairest, or as we'd say in modern speech, he's the handsomest among them. Hesiod is right, however, that order was restored from chaos a very long time ago. It's just that he misses his own point, that these components of the universe came together by necessity, not from actual love. We know that actual love was not involved in this because this order was explicitly established through violent rather than peaceful means. We have the story of, for example, the chaining and beating of the gods themselves. But we know that real love is the exact opposite of this sort of coercion. For if coercion is involved in, say, sexual intercourse, we don't call that love, instead we call that rape. On a political level also, the order that organically established itself by voluntary consent is based on love, while the political order, which has to be held together by brute force and fraud, that's called tyranny. If you want a great example of that, look at the steward-in-chief of the United States of America today. Well, even the gods owe their beautiful form to love, while deformity owes its deformity and lack of proper form to the privation of love or love's absence. Because love is good and beautiful in and of itself, he is the transitive cause of any good appearing as beauty, which, keep in mind, beauty is just visible good, um, appearing in all of the others. All right, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, Socrates' turn to speak finally arrives. But despite all of the brilliantly eloquent speeches made thus far, he cautions the people around him that they might have gone a little bit too far by indiscriminately attributing any good quality they could think of to love. In this way, they basically turn love into a mere synonym for the word good. Now, don't get me wrong, love is a good thing, but this was not exactly the right methodology to go from. Instead, it would be better to try to understand what love is in and of itself, rather than to just try to think of all the ways that love is obviously something that is good. Rather than sing a hymn of praise then, which was basically what the former were all doing by equating love with what is good in general, Socrates tells his audience that he would prefer to tell them the truth about love and what love really is, but he can only do this if he actually goes back to what he learned about the topic from somebody else who, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, was a mysterious woman named Diotima of Mantinea, who was somebody known to have offered the sacrifices which succeeded in delaying a plague by 10 years. That's how knowledgeable she was in, say, religious practice. Well, she was also very knowledgeable about Eros, so knowledgeable, in fact, that um, whereas Socrates usually can only admit that the one thing he knows is that he doesn't know anything about the philosophical topic being discussed, um, the symposium is an exception to that. When he hears, oh, we're discussing uh, horniness, sex, uh, sexual desire, I, I definitely know a lot about this topic. Let me speak, but in speaking, finally, he just tells us about um, a dialogue that uh, he had had with this woman many years ago. So, once again, the style of the symposium is different from the others, because here we do get a so Socratic dialogue nested within this story consisting of long speeches from others as being recounted many years after the fact uh, by uh, Apollodorus when he's asked about it. Here we have another one nested in here, but he, in this Socratic dialogue, it's actually Socrates himself who is being Socratized by a woman. She's the one who teaches him through this back and forth what Eros really means. Now, the first thing we learn about Socrates' education on love is that, once again, it's a mistake to simply treat love as a synonym for the good. But that does not automatically mean that love is bad, either. Rather, love is one of those strange things which is, by its very nature, an intermediary or mean between two extremes. This might be compared to right opinion, as the text itself does. Right opinion is not ignorance, but it's also not wisdom, because it's the intermediary between the two. And we now learn, more specifically, that the the thing which love is an intermediary between is, on the one hand, the divine, and on the other, the mortal. Or more specifically, love is the intermediary between the prayers which man sends out to the divine and the gifts which the divine sends back 
to man. Earlier it was noted that desire inherently implies lack because you can only desire something if you don't have it. This is something which play, which Socrates at the moment accepts, but he warns us that um, it's just as easy to miss that uh, the opposite is also true. So on the one hand, the person who has wisdom doesn't lack it, so they can't desire it, but uh, the ignorant person somehow does not desire wisdom despite the fact that they lack it. For to be ignorant is precisely to be content with one's lack of knowledge and to have no desire to change it. So the philosopher is also in the intermediary in much the same way that love is. Philosophy and love in this sense are structurally analogous to one another. Another error which Socrates corrects now is the idea that love must be the most beautiful because it has something to do with desire, and of course, beauty is desired. Well, this makes the subtle error of confusing love with the beloved. Of course, the beloved is beautiful, but why is the beautiful desired except for the deeper reason that beauty is something of a manifestation of this much more important thing called the good? We learned in the Phaedrus, for example, that um, beauty is not necessarily more more important than the other forms within the world of ideas. It's just easier to recollect because beauty by its very nature is the good made visibly manifest in things like say art, according to Hegel, but even just within beautiful things in nature like say trees and you have beautiful birds and, and the sky and lakes and things like that. So um, obviously the beautiful is something that we have a desire to see, but that's because it allows us to recollect this much more important thing called the good, which really does go back to the world of ideas. So it is true that in love you are seeking to restore something that was fragmented. You want to make it whole again. It's just that the thing you are trying to restore is not the other half of the androgynous body, which was half male and half female, as mentioned by one of the other speakers. Rather, um, what love seeks to restore is the much more more primordial form of the good. When Plato's mouthpiece says here, um, there's nothing which men love except the good, he actually sounds a lot like Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics. You might remember Aristotle said that all human acts, even if they're evil on the surface, are still somehow teleologically aimed at the good. Well, this is especially true in love. You are aimed at the possession of the good, but it's not just any good, it's rather the everlasting good and the everlasting nature of the kind of desire that you have in love is something which is, once again, easily distorted or obscured in its surface level forms within the fallen half-awake body. But if you have a proper recollection of what love really is through understanding its relation to the good, this will all make a lot more sense. But we see this tendency to uh, be teleologically oriented towards the restoration of the eternal good, even in something as basic as procreation. For in procreation, you have a desire for the proper order of, say, a baby who has a beautiful form. We know this because you are trying to avoid things like, say, defects in the birth, as noted by Plato himself in this text. And this is because um, the order which you are seeking out in that baby is reduplicating an order which you recognize to be divine. This is the reason, by the way, why you are attracted to a woman who is beautiful, because you have an instinctual understanding that a woman who has a good form herself will give birth to a baby with that proper form. Well, generation in this sense is just really the mortal's attempt to achieve the eternal good here on earth, because when a, a birth happens, a new life comes to emerge just as the older life is fading away. This is kind of like what Hegel said in the fourth section of the Phenomenology of Spirit. That's the section that introduces self-consciousness through the new motif of life. Well, the paradox of life, as we saw in that part of Hegel, um, is that um, if a rabbit um, is only focused on on meeting basic survival needs like getting enough food and water to survive, um, it will survive for a short amount of time, but eventually it will still die um, in a space of time which uh, to nature is uh, less than a blink of an eye. Well, if two rabbits have sexual reproduction, on the other hand, then the rabbit will live on forever. But this is the true rabbit, which is not any one rabbit, but rather the species of the rabbit as such. And this is really the way that love has a connection with the eternal good being preserved appearing on the earth, even when it is functioning at the level of animals' desire for reproduction and procreation. Well, from this standpoint, we can understand that recollection is also a type of 
generation or birth in this sense because when a mind within a body in this life recollects eternal knowledge it regenerates that once again by allowing the eternal to appear within the temporal in much the same way that procreation allows the eternal rabbit to live on in the birth of this new particular rabbit. Likewise, Socrates notes that even uh, one of the other speeches earlier that night talking about Achilles had slightly missed the point, because Achilles did indeed die on the battlefield for the sake of some higher value. It just wasn't love for Patroclus, his friend. It was rather his desire for the Eternal which motivated him to do that. He knew that dying in battle would end his earthly life, but it would immortalize his glory in the medium of epic poetry, as it did. This is once again a desire for the eternal, which is love, precisely because it is not the kind of love which the others had portrayed. Likewise, the real science of love is not just about procreation, as would be the case for, say, rabbits. Rather, it's really about the pursuit of the eternal in all things, which means the pursuit of the form or the idea from the world which lies beyond this one. To quote from the text, beauty absolute, separate, simple, and everlasting, which without diminution and without increase or any change, is imparted to the ever-growing and perishing beauties of all other things. Well, this is the kind of beauty which can appear on this earth as good, but that is in itself just a step upwards to the real beauty which is within the world of ideas. Socrates affirms that he is convinced of the truth of this woman's words, so the irony here is that amongst this group of men at the symposium, the final word on love really is given by the woman who educated Socrates on the subject many years ago.